Good evening, everyone. I uh, would like to welcome all of you, the nurses, the allied health professionals, and other care providers from UCSF and around the Bay Area who have joined us for this special event. And a special welcome, of course, to the family and friends of Adam Clore. We're here tonight thanks to Adam, who passionately wanted to support the ongoing education of nurses and allied health professionals who care for neuro-oncology patients. Now, Adam was both a nurse and a brain tumor patient. He was a courageous, graceful, purposeful man with a keen sense of humor. He had a huge heart and a desire to ensure that nurses were given opportunities to learn about neuro-oncology survivorship, caregiver support, and palliative care. So our first lecture was in 2019, and this was special and memorable evening. We had gathered for dinner and celebrated and recognized the nursing and allied health professional teams who work together to provide care for the neuro-oncology patient. And tonight, although virtually, we gather again to celebrate the members of the many specialty areas who care for our patients. And these range from those working in the emergency room and radiology, the operating room, recovery room, ICU, the main floors, rehab units, and all of the outpatient units as well. Um, you know, we are really want to recognize the other disciplines that are involved in the care of brain tumor patients, social workers, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, and psychologists. And most of us work in different specialties and are sometimes isolated from each other, but we all have the common goal of providing excellent care to our brain tumor patients. So I'd like to thank you for your compassionate and outstanding care of our patients and families. Now tonight in honor of Adam, we're offering a great series of talks. We hope you'll find useful in your day-to-day -day care. And thanks to these three amazing clinicians who will share information with the goal of improving our understanding of the cognitive and behavioral symptoms that neuro-oncology patients may experience, as well as specific strategies and interventions that nurses and other allied health professionals can use to manage and alleviate these symptoms. So our plan for tonight is to let our speakers share their content one after another. And if you have questions, please forward them to us via the chat feature and we'll collate them and get to the, as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Also at the very end, we will send out an evaluation form which we hope all of you will complete. And your feedback is very important to us. So um, please let us know what you think of the lectureship and, and the ideas for further um, topics that we could be covering. Now, if you want nursing CEUs, you'll be required to complete this in order to get your um, the certification. So I'd like to introduce our speakers for tonight. They're truly a powerhouse trio when it comes to managing cognitive and behavioral concerns of the brain tumor patients and their families treated at UCSF. And they are really the core of our neurocognitive care clinic. So Dr. Christine Weirmut Jamora is a licensed psychologist and she specializes in clinical neuropsychology. She's also a registered nurse and she's been practicing in San Francisco for over 10 years. She has several leadership roles at UCSF. She is an associate clinical professor in the Department of Neurosurgery and Division of Neuro-Oncology and she directs the Neurocognitive Care Clinic. She's also the director of the Neuropsychology Service at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and she actively trains a lot of medical trainees and nursing staff. She provides leadership direction as well for the um, fellowship uh, in neuropsychology. In her clinical practice, Dr. Warajimura specializes in neurocognitive rehabilitation of adults with brain tumors, and she provides baseline assessments along with development of individual treatment plans for um, how to improve the quality of life of these patients. Dr. Melissa Bree is a staff neuropsychologist in the Neurocognitive Clinic at UCSF Neuro-Oncology, and she also specializes in the neurocognitive rehabilitation. She offers assessments and treatment plans really to help patients achieve the goals to return to work, for example, to improve the family dynamics and other groups. So both Dr. Warajimura and Bree have a research interest to understand the factors that improve cognitive and emotional function of adults with patients with brain tumors and their caregivers, and to also develop evidence strategies for reducing the impact of cognitive issues. Dr. Bree's additional interests includes chronic disease model management of brain tumors, um, influences of brain health, such as nutrition and exercise, health psychology, interventions, and integrative health, as well as equitable healthcare. 
Alexa Greenstein is a board certified family nurse practitioner. She's also in the neurocognitive clinic and assists with the development and coordination of the Sherry Sobrato Brisson Brain Cancer Survivorship Program. And in her clinical practice, she focuses on cognitive care support, behavioral management strategies, and education to brain tumor patients and their caregivers to help them achieve their wellness goals. She also co-facilitates a monthly brain tumor group for patients and caregivers. So again, thank you all for attending tonight um, for this special event. I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Bree to start the formal lectureship. Thank you, Dr. Chang. I appreciate that wonderful introduction. And we're so excited to be with you all today and to talk about this really important topic, especially in honor of Adam Carr. We feel very honored to be here. Um, I wanted to just briefly touch on the title of our presentation today, Caring for Cognitive and Behavioral Changes in Adult Primary Brain Tumor, The Critical Role of the Nurse and Allied Professionals. This is really focused on um, the nurse, allied professional, what that particular role, uh, how you play a role in the care of these patients. It's so critical um, and, and helping support you and figuring out ways to work with these uh, cognitive and behavioral challenges. So I first, before we went uh, too far, wanted to ground this presentation in the patient's voice. Um, so that's what we're all here for, right? We're here to help support the patients. Um, and this slide sort of reflects, you know, some of the samples of comments we hear from patients that are struggling with these kinds of changes. Uh, many of the patients describe feeling distressed by forgetfulness, slow thinking, how this negatively impacts their day-to-day -day functioning, you know, noticing they don't feel like themselves, feeling isolated, um, searching for purpose, maybe not able to return to work or some of these other um, things that used to be such important uh, moments in their life and feeling, um, you know, feeling like they're, you know, not like themselves anymore, not wanting to be a forever patient and feeling scared. So um, just to bring us back to, you know, the patients that we are, are really thinking about and bringing to mind as we go through these slides tonight and thinking about how we can best serve them. So uh, one of the things that we hear most and that research has shown is actually that the uh, both patients and caregivers um, include that retention of cognitive functioning and you know, managing cognitive symptoms as one of their top three priorities when considering future brain treatments or how they're going to proceed with their care. Maintaining that ability to function cognitively is always in that top three. So we know that that you know, demonstrates the importance of cognitive care in their treatment planning. It's really an important thing to be considering throughout. Um, so all of us from time to time may have experienced, you know, forgetting a word we're trying to remember, trying to, uh, you know, look for our keys. We've forgotten where we put those. Maybe going into a room and forgetting why you went in there. That was classic, right? Um, so these are common lapses that everyone might experience, especially when tired or stressed that can make, make things so much harder. Um, but there's more so when there's changes to the brain them, itself. So when there's actually impact from the brain tumor from the treatments, these kinds of lapses are, are gonna be more significant. So these cancer related thinking changes are common. Um, cognition can be defined as, you know, a mental action or a process of acquired knowledge, or maybe understanding through thought. Um, some describe this experience and the senses. Um, so these processes, if you think about it, include thinking, knowing, remembering, um, judging, you know, problem solving, some of those higher level complex kinds of activities that encompass language, imagination, perception, planning. These are the kinds of things we're talking about when we talk about cognition and cognitive changes. Um, so if you're looking at this slide here, what we're trying to kind of point out is that, you know, cognitive changes are common across the board in cancer, but especially for central nervous system tumors, this is particularly common. Um, more than 50 to 70% of individuals with brain tumors are thought to have cognitive changes with uh, patients reporting greater than 80% of symptoms related to the brain cancer. So that's a direct result of the tumor and the treatments they've received. Um, so thinking broadly, kind of how common is this? Let's think about that. Over 700,000 Americans are living with brain tumor with meningiomas, uh, but even though rarely malignant, being the most common of the malignant type glioblastoma or GBM as we refer to it frequently is the most common. 
only uh, 15 to 20% of gliomas are considered to be low grade. Uh, peak incidences in young adults, approximately 30 to 40 years old. Survival rate in patients with those lower grade gliomas um, is increasing, which is great news it, due to all the great surgical techniques we have, advanced treatments in radiotherapy, chemotherapy, all the advances we've made in treatment. So the survival times are expanding, ranging five to 15 years. Though with the increase in survival time, we're now seeing some of these side effects from the treatments coming into people's lives and making an impact on their day-to-day -day functioning. Um, and there is still a controversy with respect to the best timing of treatment. So, you know, particularly surgery, surgery, radiotherapy, when do those uh, treatment choices make the best sense? So as such, um, therapy choices may vary significantly across clinicians, across hospitals. Um, there's a lot of considerations for those long-term consequences of the treatment. And when is the best timing for a patient? When is it going to have um, the least amount of impact and um, how is that going to interfere with their daily functioning, their language, sensory motor function, and all of that. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that determine the prognosis someone may have and the treatment response. One of these things that you might hear come up is IDH mutation. That's considered to have a more favorable prognosis, although that being said, 70% of IDH mutated gliomas are located in the frontal lobes, and that tends to be associated with the most cognitive and most behavioral impact. So um, while they may have better prognosis regarding mortality with that IDH mutation, there might be a greater potential that they have those cognitive and behavioral changes that can significantly impact their quality of life. So that's something to consider when working with folks with that, that brain tumor, that type of brain tumor. Um, so there's also a high variability in the prevalence of cognitive and quality uh, of life impairment, ranging from 19 to 83% individual differences across the affected domains. How that shows up person to person can be different. Um, a significant proportion of the patients though have shown impairments prior to the surgery and some authors detected up to 92% of those patients experiencing mood and cognitive related changes during their medical course. And that's something to just consider. I'm gonna keep kind of talking about that is that the trajectory is, we're thinking long-term, right? And there's there's differences for each medical course. There's going to be uh, uh, changes along the medical course, different timings for treatments and things. So it's a kind of dynamic process. Um, there are also many influential factors that have been noted to affect cognitive expression. So things like the tumor location, seizure medications, prior medical history, age, education, all of these things we're gonna talk about in a later slide. So again, there's that variability while, although we know cognitive symptoms might be, um, you know, highly ubiquitous, it might vary how it shows up for a person and the severity and things may depend on the unique sort of makeup of each person and what's contributing to their presentation. Okay, so looking again at that sort of trajectory, we wanna think about sort of the, the cognitive changes over time that you might see. Um, so not only is it per person going to be a little different, each person may have sort of changes with their cognition as their treatment changes as well. Um, so even during periods of relative stability, um, patients often have cognitive concerns that can it negatively impact their day-to-day -day functioning. So what this graphic is sort of trying to illustrate is this idea that the impact that the tumor can have, looking at this, there's this presumed pre-tumor baseline, the tumor development, there starts to be a gap that develops between what a person's sort of cognitive ability and skill set is versus the environmental or demands around them, the expectations they have on how their cognition is supposed to perform. And that gap starts to widen after receiving some of the tumor treatments. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is, what the effects are they have on the brain. Um, and as they start to go back out after treatment into the world, start to try to re-engage in work, their family, things like that, those expectations, the complexities of their day increase. So that gap starts to widen even more as their skill set is not, is not maybe where it was prior to the treatments. So where rehab and some of these other interventions that we might suggest for you guys today uh, and things to look for might exist in this gap where we're noticing that what they have uh, cognitively able to sort of contribute to their day-to-day -day functioning is not matching up with the demands on them that they have in their day-to-day -day life anymore. And right there is where kind of some of the trouble lies, where some of the symptoms come up. Um, 
Okay, so this is just kind of a little refresher on some neuroanatomy, just to kind of get us oriented as we're talking about different symptoms and things we might see. Um, just a brief uh, review, frontal lobe, it's really associated with uh, those emotional behavioral kinds of symptoms that really is uh, associated with controlling and modulating mood and affect, verbal expression, some of those complex activities, like we mentioned before, problem solving, decision making, planning, organizing, but also some of those uh, things you associate with mood or um, sort of personality, like someone's motivation to do something, um, controlling themselves in social situations, uh, their ability to pay attention when you're talking or doing other things. Um, the parietal lobes looking more at sort of tactile things, sensory, spatial information, academic skills, um, that object naming can come in there. Some of those word naming difficulties may locate in that area. Uh, visual attention, hand-eye coordination, occipital lobes really, really known for the visual stuff that seems to be its primary job is looking at visual processing. Temporal lobe, you're looking more at that memory piece, face recognition, locating objects that finding keys around the house, that sort of thing. Um, emotional responses can also come from that area, but language in particular, that's kind of that's kind of the main area we're looking at when there's language concerns. Temporal, temporal lobe has a, a big role to play in that. Okay, let me get us to the next one here. So in thinking about that, um, it's important to remember that, you know, while everyone, not everyone that has a brain tumor is going to have cognitive effects. Let's also put that out there. It's really common as we mentioned, but not everyone's gonna have those kinds of thinking challenges. The ones that people do tend to have, if they're going to though, tend to be within these four domains of functioning. So attention and concentration, you're really looking at that ability to focus, respond to a stimulus, that ability to concentrate. Um, I hear folks uh, saying, you know, I just lost my train of thought. That's really, really common. That's that attention piece, right? Memory, we're looking at, you know, being able to remember to take medications, remember appointments. Uh, where did I put my glasses down? Some of those pieces might be linked to that trouble with memory, recalling conversations that comes up a lot too. I, I swear you didn't tell me about that. Executive functioning, that's the other area, uh, looking at being able to monitor our behavior, control over what we're doing. Um, trouble with organizing, planning, reasoning, problem solving become might become more challenging um, and people may need extra help in that process. Processing speed also tends to slow down from some of these treatments. Um, that's really uh, um, affecting the efficiency in which you're thinking and you're completing tasks. Um, some people might just say, it takes me so much longer to do something. My thinking feels sluggish. Um, that's something we frequently hear as well. All right, and then coming back around to this idea Oh, let's get a little graphic. Okay. Coming back around to this idea of other factors that can impact cognition, right? Some of them are pretty static, you know, not going to really change over time. Like maybe the amount of education you've had or um, the tumor location, that's not going to change uh, the biology behind it. But some things are more dynamic and have some fluidity to them. So your mood, the, the fatigue that you might be experiencing, that, that side, sort of thing can have some ebb and flow to it. So this, this is important to kind of keep in mind that there's some of these things are modifiable or might be variable with time and with situation. And those are some of the areas we can really make a lot of impact because we know those have some movement around them. Um, this is also pointing out too, though, that, you know, 92% of folks demonstrate both mood and cognitive impairments. So mood is a piece of the puzzle as well that we need to be considering. And we'll talk about that next. But fatigue, that's a huge piece. I know uh, Dr. Wire Jamar will go more into that. But fatigue can be something that's really uh, a complex thing that has a huge impact on cognition and tends to be uh, a result of the tumor and the treatments and going through uh, cancer in general. That's oftentimes a, a piece of the puzzle. Um, so looking more a little bit at the tumor treatments, I just want to touch on what we're thinking a little bit about why that's impacting cognition. I'll just briefly mention that, you know, radiotherapy for thinking about that, that, you know, there's uh, inflammation that that process can cause. It disrupts this sort of, you know, micro environment that can lead to a degenerative sort of process or change to and chronic chronic damage to the neurons themselves and the transmission that they have talking with each other. Um, so that can really have a, a big change on 
the processing speed, for instance, or uh, the hippocampus in particular is sensitive to uh, some of the injury from radiotherapy, and that's responsible for memory. So there's things that research has shown uh, does tend to be impacted on that microenvironment sort of level from these treatments. The other one, chemotherapy, also demonstrates some neurotoxic effects. Um, so looking at that, you know, you're really thinking about some of the mechanisms for injury that's cytotoxic, there's these sort of targeted agents that's not really well understood, but we definitely are able to capture and research that that does have this neurotoxic effect on the brain and its ability to function. Other things to consider are medications that a lot of people are on possibly lifelong at that, at that point, maybe, uh, you know, um, anti-seizure medication. Some folks go through periods of steroids that can have a huge impact on both cognition and behavior. I think we'll be uh, touching on that more as well. Um, and then, oh, there's little dots for that too. Okay. And <laughs> then, uh, very briefly, I just want to touch um, on the neuropsychic, uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms. Sorry. Um, this is something that comes up a lot. I know in my work, I know Dr. Wyatt Moore and, uh, and Alexa would agree with me that there's oftentimes an overlap between the two. Uh, it's really important to be tracking mood because 75% of patients have some sort of uh, functionally impairing symptoms. Depression reported in 2.5 up to 44% of patients with brain tumor. So that's a wide range, but it also is potentially a really almost half, right? That's a, that can be a really huge group. Um, more commonly with left frontal lobe tumors, um, which we also mentioned earlier was also more likely to have cognitive concerns. Um, so the neurobehavioral changes are not infrequent by any means, and often the most difficult to manage, those tend to be some of the behavioral symptoms that we'll see and that caregivers might be talking most about. Um, low mood irritability, angry outbursts, there might be apathy or withdrawing from things. People will say to me, he just doesn't seem like my husband anymore. Personality changes, a lack of motivation to do things, kind of getting up and at him. I know Dr. Wajimara has a lovely phrase of my my get up and go, got up and went. I have so many patients really relate to that. Um, so that's uh, something else to consider is just that where is sort of that component, where's the overlaying mechanism of how is mood impacting the cognition as well? Because that does really contribute to challenges in returning to some of those quality of life activities. And, uh, you know, and they show that in 25% of patients, it really does limit their functioning overall. So that's an important thing to consider. We're going to talk more about it as well. I want to go ahead and hand the reins over, though, to Alexa Greenstein, who's going to continue to talk with us more about the specific nursing approaches to these cognitive and behavioral changes. Right. Thanks, Alexa. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bree. And as we just heard, uh, cognitive dysfunction is a common experience amongst patients with brain tumors. And nurses and allied professionals in all care and clinical settings play a vital role in assessing and reducing the functional impact of cognitive and behavioral changes experienced by brain tumor patients. So now I'd like to spend some time and take a closer look as to how nurses and allied health professionals, core and critical members of the patient's care team can assist with cognitive support We'll be focusing on the nursing assessment, nursing interventions to help address cognitive and behavioral changes, and the nurse's role in cognitive care advocacy. Next slide. During the course of illness, individuals can experience a range of cognitive, behavioral, physical um, symptoms, and these symptoms vary markedly from person to person, as Dr. Bree just mentioned. While some of these symptoms can cause dysfunction and be readily apparent and easy to identify, others may be invincible or subtle and have very little or significant impact on daily functioning. Next slide. For many, further assessment and evaluation of cognitive dysfunction occurs because of a patient or caregiver reported concern or clinician suspicion. When beginning any clinical intake or nurse assessment, establishing a nurse-patient relationship founded in trust and respect is critical. In the bustle of caring for patients in a clinic, it could be easy to forget that an individual's cogn cognition, learning approach, and achievement is closely tied to socio-cultural constructs and values. Attitudes and perceptions of cognitive symptoms can vary greatly among culture groups. It could be very painful, embarrassing, and scary to tell clinicians, family members, and loved ones what is happening cognitively. So being sensitive and empathetic to feelings of low self-esteem, fears, perceived threats, and frustrations that can accompany cognitive dysfunction lays the foundation to a therapeutic nurse-patient alliance. 
Another way that we can help build and maintain a therapeutic alliance with our patients is letting the patient set the pace of the clinical interview and assessment whenever possible, keeping in mind the patient's cognitive abilities. A person's ability to recall and share historical information can vary significantly depending on the severity of their cognitive deficit. Prolonged periods of paying attention, organizing, and articulating thoughts can be mentally and cognitively taxing. So talking slowly, calmly, and deliberately allows for more opportunities to process information and help support patient understanding. Also being mindful to avoid asking excessive questions can offer frequent breaks um, can offset patient fatigue. The art of communication is something I can re remember very uh, vividly when I was uh, back in nursing school and maybe other nurses on this call um, as well. But asking open questions were, was always the gold standard and the correct answer on any nursing test. But asking open-ended questions such as, tell me what is going on at home or can you care to explain some of the changes that you're can experiencing can be quite challenging and frustrating for some patients who experience more advanced cognitive impairments. While asking open-ended questions is a wonderful technique to collect information, we know that a, not a one-size-fits-all approach to care uh, works in, help, in, our, in managing um, patients. So in situations where the patient has more moderate to severe cognitive vulnerabilities or aphasia, to keep the patient involved in the assessment process without causing additional stress, short yes or no response questions can be beneficial. In many cases, collection of collateral information from the patient's caregiver and family will be needed to verify historical information. To protect and honor the patient's privacy, be sure to ask the patient how he or she sees the caregiver's or family member's role in their, in their um, care, and if that individual could, is welcome to participate in the clinical interview. In some cases, the patient may have a healthcare proxy where that individual has legal authority to be involved in the patient's Having the caregiver and family input provides valuable insight and perspective as to the patient's status and their level of support. Something worth noting is that caregivers and family members may be afraid and reluctant, reluctant to be honest and forthcoming of some of the patient's symptoms they observe in, in front of the patient in fear it may upset them or insult their loved one. Therefore, a separate conversation with the patient's caregiver may be warranted at times. It helps to start the clinical interview by asking a history of the problem asking questions about the presence, complaint, and nature of the symptoms. Understanding what the first symptoms were and when they started can be helpful to diagnose potential urgent and life-threatening conditions. Imagine receiving a phone call with, with, from a caregiver who says her mom was fine a few days ago when she visited her. However, she took her shopping today and she seems extremely confused and continues to get worse and seems very lethargic. In this vignette example, the patient's abrupt and progressive change in cognition and mental status is concerning. In the presence of sudden onset mental status change in a person with a brain tumor, one must consider the diagnosis of acute illness, infection, bleed, blood clots, and brain swelling. Symptoms with an insidious onset or no clear start date, slowly evolving changes are more indicative of degenerative diseases and brain tumor and treatment effect. Gathering information about symptoms, characteristics, aggravating and alleviating factors patterns and previous treatments can help shape next steps in the clinical intake. Next slide. After establishing a better understanding of the patient's symptoms, it's important to assess the extent of functional impact and identify any safety issues. Many patients with cognitive limitations develop alternative means of coping with their deficits that allow them to live independently. However, as a person's cognitive abilities decline, there's often less insight to cognitive vulnerabilities. And impaired judgment makes things such as driving, cooking, grooming, managing finances much more difficult, thus creating more stress and demands for caregiver support and concerns for safety. When assessing the impact of cognitive symptoms, day-to-day -day function is a good indicator of how someone is managing. Asking questions whether patients' basic, in, basic and in, instrumental activities of daily living have been affected can help shed light on the debilitating effects stemming from cognitive dysfunction, as well as everyday realities. It's also prudent to identify potential safety concerns when it comes to medication management, falls, home, home security, and firearms. While the nurse or allied health professional is trying to understand some of the areas of vulnerability and weakness, it's important to also understand that there are areas of the person still functioning successfully and what are they good at. This can help the nurse and clinician better understand remaining cognitive strengths and abilities. Next slide. There are numerous and medical, mental, and 
physical conditions that can contribute to cognitive dysfunction and are present with symptoms resembling cognitive impairment. Many patients have systemic disorders such as hypertension, diabetes, sleep apnea, which increase risk for cognitive dysfunction. Because of the high comorbidity rate of depression and cognitive impairment and prevalence of mood disorders in patients living with brain tumors, the detection of depression is important. Nurses should have a high index of suspicion, especially when there's a personal or first degree biological relative with a history of depression. There are several standardized screening tools that can help assess depression, such as the Beck Depression Inventory and PHQ-2. The figure on the slide is not an exhaustive list of all the potential medical and psychiatric etiologies that can be linked with cognitive change. However, one should keep in mind that there are many non-brain tumor causes to cognitive dysfunction. Asking about sleep habits is crucial to the evaluation of cognitive symptoms. As we know, restorative sleep is essential for brain and bodily function. Numerous studies have linked sleep problems with increased risk for memory difficulties, so nurses and allied health professionals can be active team members when screening for sleep disturbances such as sleep apnea and restless leg syndrome. The relationship between pain and cognitive dysfunction is also worth exploring. Research has shown that pain triggers elevated cortisol levels, which causes the hippocampus to shrink, negatively impacting memory and concentration. Also, pain can interfere with sleep. Assessing pain is a valuable tool and something that may not always be properly addressed given someone's cognitive communication disabilities. Visual analog scales like the long Baker faces pain rating scale and physiological indicators such as heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure may be needed as cognitive and communication abilities worsen towards end of life. And an individual is experiencing or reporting cognitive impairment, they should be asked about their vision and hearing. The brain relies on its vision and hearing to make sense of the world. Any problems noted with hearing and vision should be further identified and compensated for. Next slide. A, physio, a physiosocial assessment can reveal valuable information. Having fundamental knowledge about the systems in which a person operates can be a resourceful assessment tool. What is the patient support system made of? What is their living situation like? How is their home environment? Who is involved in their care? Awareness of an individual's cultural and spiritual practices can, and beliefs can share insight as to how the person may perceive and approach their symptoms and condition. Determining coping skills is another important aspect of the psychosocial assessment. When confronted with a life-threatening illness and changes in identity, it is understandable for one to experience diminished capacity to cope with the demands of life. Knowledge about the patient's current coping strategies will provide clues to maladaptive patterns and habits, as well as sources of strength. Cognitive impairment and challenging behaviors such as aggression, agitation, and wandering significantly increase care burden and lay that groundwork for caregiver strain. Caregivers have their own needs for education and support. Therefore, a crucial aspect of the clinical interview is to complete a caregiver assessment aimed at identifying the caregiver's current coping techniques, strengths, and potential unmet needs. Next slide. As Dr. Bree mentioned, medication side effects and medications can have an influence on cognitive performance. So a thorough medication review and reconciliation is another important assessment. Uh, numerous medications have sedating and neurological effects that can influence cognitive abilities. Some commonly prescribed drugs that we see with patients with brain tumors are anti-seizure medication and corticosteroids. While anti-seizure medications help to treat and manage seizures, they can impair judgment, attention, and processing speed. Corticosteroids such as dexamethasone are often given to the treatment of vasogenic edema, and perioperative corticosteroids can even actually help cognition because of diminishing edema. But there is evidence of cognitive effects of long-term corticosteroid use. Corticosteroids can also give rise to behavioral changes such as insomnia, mood swings, anger outbursts, and in some cases, acute psychosis. Substance use and dependence and withdrawal, especially alcohol withdrawal, can be a common reason for seizures and cognitive symptoms. Polypharmacy also carries a risk for cognitive dysfunction due to increased potential for drug and drug interruptions and risk for non-adherence. Medication reconciliation can help to identify high-risk medications and ensure proper medication adherence. Next slide. As previously mentioned, there are various types of medical disorders that can affect brain function. Reviewing data gather, gathered from diagnostic and laboratory tests can provide evidence of other comorbid medical conditions that might explain the underlying diagnosis or etiology. Vital signs can be checked to ensure adequate blood flow, oxygen is going to the brain and other vital organs, neuroimaging such as a CT scan or MRI scan can help to rule out evidence of bleed, swelling, and evidence of other brain tumors. An EEG may be ordered as part of the evaluation for patients with brain tumors given the high prevalence of seizures in this population. 
blood and urine tests can help exclude potential reversible causes of cognitive dysfunction, such as anemia, infection, metabolic and hormonal balances, vitamin de deficiency, and the presence of illegal drugs. Next slide. Following a detailed clinical interview and history intake, a physical assessment is performed. When there is a history or evidence of abnormalities in cognition behavior, whether it be acute or chronic, a neurological examination is one of the most resourceful components of the physical exam. Depending on the clinical situation, a comprehensive neurological exam may be performed. In some cases, only a few components of the examination may be completed. The mental status examination is very helpful when it comes to distinguishing mood and thought disorders and cognitive impairment. As a person becomes less aware and attend, as they become less aware and have less judgment, they may be less in tune to their health and, and hygiene needs. So for the general appearance and behavior component of the mental status exam, we want to take some personal um, note of their hygiene and dress as this could indicate potential needs with activities of daily living and also can help detect problems such as inadequate nutrition, dental disease, and skin infections. Any signs of trauma such as bruising could be a sign of injury or abuse and something to keep an eye out for, especially in this vulnerable population. And for behavior, you're going to look for excessive or reduced bodily movements and maybe point to one specific medical condition versus another. You want to pay attention to their speech. Is it slow? Is it fast, pressured, or normal? Does the patient experience any communication difficulties? In earlier stages of cognitive impairment, one may experience more word searching and word finding challenges. What is the patient's form of thinking and thought content? Are the patient's thoughts organized, loosely associated, or goal-directed? This assessment can uncover potential delusions, hallucinations, anxieties, and obsessions. Taking time to assess the patient's gait can provide great utility. Since walking requires integration of several motor, vestibular, cerebellar, and proprioceptive pathways, completing a gait and a stance assessment can guide the focus of the rest of the neurological exam. Also, given the high risk of falls in this population, this could be a critical safety assessment. Cardiovascular and respiratory exam might suggest underlying vascular and respiratory causes of cognitive symptoms and should be considered when performing the physical assessment. Next slide. Performing more detailed cognitive screening can assist with treatment planning, ongoing care, and referral to specialist teams. There are many standardized cognitive screening tools that can be administered administer that Dr. Wardamore will touch on a little later in the presentation. Aside from cognitive screening, ample information can be gleaned from the, from the mental status examination to determine a patient's cognitive functioning. Mental examination evaluates different areas of cognitive function. This includes orientation, attention, memory, language, executive function. To test orientation, the person is asked what's their name, what is today's date, and is, what is named the place or location that they are in. Loss of orientation, especially not knowing one's own name, can indicate severe cognitive impairment or delirium. Asking the patient to spell a five-letter word back forward and backwards is a way to assess attention and concentration. In order to assess a patient's short-term memory, we'll ask the patient to recall three objects after about two to five minutes. Asking a question about the patient's past, such as what the city they were born in, can help to assess long-term memory. Having the patient name many objects in a single category, such as an article or clothing or animals, as in one minute and or presenting an object such as a pen and having the patient name it will can uncover word finding difficulties and paraphasias. Have the patient follow commands can to determine their ability to process and comprehend language. And to assess executive function, ask the patient to identify a unifying theme of between three or four objects. For example, how is an apple, orange, and banana related? The correct answer is that they're all fruit. The response conveys abstract thinking. Opposed to a response such as that they're all round items may suggest a more concrete thinking. Another way to assess abstract thinking is by, make, by asking the patient to interpret a moderately challenging proverb such as, you should not cry over spilled milk. A person's judgment can be assessed by asking hypothetical situations such as, what would you do if you saw, if you saw or smelled smoke in your house? To properly assess the patient's mental status, the examiner should follow a few key roles. First, have some understanding of the patient's language and sociocultural background. For some whom English is a second language, may not fully understand components of the examination. Be certain that questions should be given the patient's native language and terms are culturally relevant. For example, the proverbs used in the mental status exam. Whenever performing any assessment, it's essential to keep background noise and activity to a minimum. It is very challenging for a person with cognitive difficulties to concentrate on more than one thing at a time. 
to try and find a quiet room free of distraction. Pay attention to environmental influences such as physical and sensory factors and make sure that the room is comfortable, a temperature and that the patient can see you and hear you. The patient should also be encouraged to wear corrective lenses and assistive hearing devices. Screening should be avoided when patients are tired, hungry, or experiencing pain or discomfort as this can negatively impact performance. Lastly, adopting a progress not perfection attitude can be helpful. One of the major limitations to the mental status exam is the amount of time it may require to complete the assessment. In an ideal world, a comprehensive mental status exam and cognitive assessment will consider all the potential variables and factors that can impact a person's cognition. But this is not always a realistic or feasible based on the clinical setting and conditions. Having some information to interpret is better than nothing. Next slide. So with cognitive and behavioral um, changes and impairments can be a very debilitating factor in one's brain tumor journey, often limiting and interfering in individual function and quality of life. These are often profound changes, um, have detrimental effects not only on the individual, but the family, community, and larger society. And this can cause immense suffering, frustration, and distress. And nurses and allied health professionals can help to mitigate those uh, distressors by thinking of some nursing interventions. And for today's purposes and for the presentation, we're just going to categorize them into five broad categories, um, expression, education, environment, empowerment, and advocacy. First, we're going to touch on expression. So there are, very, there are several approaches that nurses can utilize to help improve patients' ability to express and communicate their health concerns and preferences and maximize cognitive functioning. Starting with every patient encounter, introducing yourself and calling the patient by their preferred name. Patients with memory difficulties often need frequent reorientation. Some of our brain tumor patients suffer with facial blindness or facial agnosia, where they're unable to recognize faces. Also, this is just good nursing practice and helps us, makes the patient feel supported and cared for. Establish and maintain eye contact as this enhances the patient's attentional arousal and focus bearing in mind that some cultures may find direct eye contact inappropriate. Speaking in a calm and warm tone, pacing speech, and keeping sentences short and simple is helpful when communicating with patients who have aphasia and are slow thinking. Using language-specific interpreters when needed in culturally relevant terms can help patients feel understood and involved in their care. Active listening. Uh, active listening, yeah, carefully paying attention to both for, uh, both verbal and nonverbal communication can assist, can assist better understanding the patient's thoughts and feelings. Repeating and paraphrasing, using the patient's own words and teaching back are just some techniques to assist with memory, learning, and comprehension. Talking through steps and demonstrating when possible are key ingredients to learning and retaining new information. If a patient is experiencing aphasia, pictures and gestures may be necessary for meaningful communication. Next slide. One of the most important roles as a nurse or allied health professional is in providing patient education. Living with a brain tumor diagnosis and experiencing cognitive and behavioral changes can bring up many potential safety concerns. There are many hazards, hazards to watch out for at home and making the environment safer can lower the risk of injury and harm. Kitchens and bathrooms can be quite dangerous and when a, and when a person is confused or lacks insight, installing self timers to shut off the stove when not used, when not being used can help reduce the risk of fires. Locking up potential cleaning supplies, child-proofing child medication cabinets, or just a few other strategies nurses can share with caregivers to keep the patient safe and prevent serious accidents from occurring. Falls, cognitive splits, and behavioral outbursts are more likely to occur when a person is tired or feeling rushed. Teaching patients and caregivers to schedule activities during times of alertness and promoting the importance of rest and sleep hygiene may help prevent or reduce the likelihood of accidents and to reduce tensions that may be coming up at home. In thinking of reversible and modifiable risk factors of cognitive dysfunction, you know, promoting maintenance of self-care and good management of coexisting comorbidities, especially those that can compare blood flow to the brain, such as hypertension, high cholesterol, and diabetes, to name a few culprits. And avoiding additional head injury is another health promotion education point. Education patients on ways to reduce additional head injuries, such as wearing a helmet when riding a bicycle and a seatbelt while in a motor vehicle can help to delay further worsening cognitive symptoms. In counseling on the importance of healthy, nutritious diet, exercise, smoking sensation, and other, and other um, limiting alcohol consumption or other protective factors. Um, increasing patients and caregiver knowledge of their health condition, conditions and symptoms and management strategies can help to bolster confidence and self-determination to manage the challenges they encounter. Nurses can ensure that 
patients and caregivers are fully educated about symptoms and available community resources to support them. Next slide. Based on the principles and practices of behavioral therapy, there are environmental interventions that can be used to facilitate patient engagement and make every patient interaction an opportunity for a therapeutic one. Patients with cognitive dysfunction can be extremely sensitive to their environment. Creating and maintaining a nurturing, caring, and comforting environment allows the patient to improve their ability to attend to information and be able to best support their communication, while also simultaneously establishing trust. Tailor the patient's stimulation exposure, exposure based on the patient's needs. When patients experience overstimulation, think like a busy and noisy emergency room or restaurant, lots of noises, people, distraction, this increases confusion and agitation because the brain is requiring extra cognitive effort to sort out all the different stimuli and prioritizing what stimuli is most important. And this drains our, our cognitive um, energy. Whereas too little stimulation may cause withdrawal and apathy. Generally speaking, moderate stimulation is best, but what does that actually mean? This means ensuring adequate lighting, not too bright or dim, reducing background noise will maximize attentional arousal and patient engagement. Presence of familiar objects can offer reassurance and assist with orientation and reduce confusion. Other useful orientation measures might include displaying to-do lists, calendars, and clocks. Patients, again, should be encouraged to use hearing aids and glasses to help optimize sensory processing. Keeping assistive devices nearby also, again, supports functional status. Next slide. Continuing with environmental provision, something we might all be familiar with in our nursing studies is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Basic needs must be met for us to feel comfortable and safe. When thinking about cognitive and behavioral change, it's always wise to think about, is the person thinking differently or acting out because their basic needs are not being fulfilled? Nurses can help to make sure patient, patients are comfortable by checking for pain, hunger, thirst, constipation, a full bladder, and fatigue. Again, if sleep is so important, the lack of sleep can negatively affect you know, one's cognitive abilities and mood. So nurses can promote more interrupted sleep by keeping in mind when scheduling nursing interventions, such as position changes and timing of medications. A considerable amount of evidence supports that mental and physical exercise can help maintain optimal brain and body function. Exercise can boost levels of endorphins and promotes neuronal growth and increase connections in the brain. Working with patients, nurses can promote opportunities for mobilization and exercise. Here at UCSF, we're very fortunate to have a dedicated neuro-oncology exercise program for patients and caregivers, which is an incredible resource for patients and their family. And many people ask if there are specific things that can be done, like mental exercises or brain games to help patients with their cognition and thinking difficulties. While there is strong evidence um, that supports meaningful brain stimulating activities such as board games, crossword puzzles, playing cards, listening to music can enhance cognitive well being and quality of life. Encouraging mental activities that are appropriate for patients' abilities and skill set is recommended. Since rapid changes in routine can magnify confusion, uh, consistent care providers, walking through tasks and short and simple instructions, and maintaining a consistent daily routine can help to improve memory. Next slide. Patients are more than just their disease. We know that many patients and families lose so much to brain tumors and there's a need for help and support when it comes to managing and navigating this illness. There's so much nurses and allied health professionals can do to reduce suffering and empower their patients and caregivers to live their best lives. Deploying nursing interventions that focus on patients' unique strengths and not on problems or deficits can support the patient's capacity to become more in tune with their internal resources that they can access and tap into. Nurses can help patients and caregivers better understand and cope the with the changes that they might be experiencing by giving them an outlet to talk and listen. Normalizing and validating experiences can make patients and caregivers feel less alone and isolated. Reminding caregivers and loved ones that cognitive and behavioral symptoms are not intentional and often a result of changes in the brain. Helping patients and caregivers be resilient as possible and embracing, changing, embracing changes by educating and role modeling healthy coping techniques coaching and practicing deep breathing exercises, positive self-talk, mindfulness, and meditation can be great tools and activities for patients and caregivers to use when they're feeling overwhelmed. And at some point during the course of their illness, patients, caregivers, and families may look to outside help and resources to manage symptoms and care, empowering patients to ask questions about their management options and ways that they can maximize their independent quality of life is important. So helping to facilitate referrals to specialists and care services who can further work up and provide tools to better manage some of the cognitive behavioral symptoms can serve great utility. 
sharing information on mental health services and linking to support groups and other larger communities can keep the person and families connected and or expand their uh, support systems. And as patients near the end of life, issues such as acute confusion, reduced communication abilities and diminished memory can make it difficult for one to express their needs making end of life decisions and other legal and medical decisions very challenging. This can be quite distressing for both patients and caregivers. So nurses can play a role in raising awareness and assisting patients and their families in advanced care planning. And as a result, can make and help prepare caregivers and families to make decisions that honor the patient's wishes. Next slide. Lastly, the nurse and allied health professionals role in advocacy. Given the complex nature of many and the many underlying causes that contribute to cognitive and behavioral dysfunction, calls and warrants a multidisciplinary approach to care. Nurses can help advocate for person-centered strength-based care that maximizes independence and quality of life. Brain tumor patients constitute a vulnerable population with unique cognitive and behavioral needs, which are often unmet with cognitive with community resources. Advocating and assisting with information exchange between subspecialties and healthcare professionals can improve access to care and treatment. Given the scarcity of resources to meet the increasing demands for this type of care, the nurse can help to advocate for nurse more resources to disseminate knowledge to others who are in the field to get the privilege to work with brain tumor patients and their family. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Wara Jamora, who I have the great privilege to work with in the Neurocognitive Care Clinic. Dr. Jamora will go over, will go on to discuss common care pathways for cognitive and behavioral care, reviewing cognitive screening instruments and behavioral management best practices. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. So let's take all of this information and think about when you go back to work tomorrow, or maybe not tomorrow, whenever you do go back to work, how do we take all of this information that we just had heard that cognitive impairment is absolutely prevalent, that absolutely this is something that's so important for our patients, that it causes these changes both neurologically and psychiatrically, um, depending on the location of the tumor and other kind of factors. And then nurses absolutely have a role in this in terms of nursing assessment, as well as intervention, right? But when I think about, so I, I worked on the floors as well as in the outpatient um, as a nurse, and I think about, you know, what do I do when I go back to work? How do I work with these um, amazing professionals? And how do I work with patients in a way that I can, that it can be sustainable, as well as um, helping them along in their healing journey. So I thought that that's how we would kind of end our talk a little bit today. And then of course, we'll have questions and, and we can get to that. Um, and, and hopefully there's something in, in one of these sections that can be helpful. So we think about the common care pathways for cognitive behavioral care, that there's such a marriage between between the different services that care for patients from a cognitive perspective and the nursing practice, right? So um, as a nurse, I would see folks with that, um, you know, I would see that they were referred for neuropsych assessment or I'd see speech language pathology come in. I'd see all kinds of cognitive education. Maybe I would be doing um, some cognitive education if that was on my nursing plan, you know, especially if they have altered mental status. And so let's talk a little bit about um, neuropsych assessment and the marriage between that and how we think about um, that in, in the nursing practice, as well as cognitive rehabilitation, what that looks like, because your patients might ask you a little bit about that. And then also, how can we um, weave in the caregiver and other medical specialty understandings into your practice so that way it kind of continues to increase that capacity for managing some of these challenges. Next slide. So neuropsych assessment is um, really just an in-depth assessment, thinking about um, thinking about the thinking skills as well as the uh, coping strategies that that patients bring to their daily life. So it's brain behavior relationships, both what is going on in terms of their thinking, as well as how does that play out in their daily life. So for example, if someone has aphasia and they're having a hard time either speaking or understanding, then that would be one way in which maybe it would disrupt their social relationships or it would negatively impact their, um, their ability to convey their meaning and, 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 and thoughts to other people. So neuropsych assessment really looks at ways to understand that better, not just what the impairments are, but also what are the strengths? What, how can we, um, how can we understand what is going on with the patient that's going well, so then we can apply that in our interactions with them. So for example, maybe they have expressive aphasia and they can't express themselves, such as a Broca's aphasia, but maybe they can't understand. So we, in the nursing, you know, in my nursing practice, I would get in report that, oh, well, the, he has expressive aphasia and that would always give me the aha, 
well, but he doesn't have receptive aphasia, right? And they said, no, 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 he's fine with that. So that would give me an idea about how would I go work with Mr. Jones when I'm going in doing my head to assessment with him, for example. So I'm always, so one of the ways I think neuropsych assessment and nursing really dovetail nicely together is being able to look at not just the impairments but, that folks have, but the opportunities for places that they uh, that they do a bit better. Um, and, and so I think that, and then how that marries to their, um, their, uh, their ADLs or their IADLs whenever they're thinking about, you know, they're, um, they're managing their daily care. So some of the indications that you might see for neuropsych referral is that the patient has some cognitive complaints interfering with their health related quality of life. So we know that they're really common. Um, we also um, tend to, um, you know, march out. There's a little bit of controversy in the field. Sometimes we do, uh, there, there is a sense that you should be doing these neuropsych assessments even before they have surgery. Um, but of course it's a limited, uh, it, it's a limited resource, but so not everyone, uh, there's a bit of um, controversy in that in, in terms of access to care, and then also how that changes over time. Um, so, so, but nonetheless, we, we do often will, will see patients that have, um, or their caregivers, there's some cognitive complaints and it's negatively impacting um, the quality of life that they want to have. Um, also that maybe, um, maybe they, we want to track over time treatment effects. That's another question that we sometimes get. Um, and I think that in many, um, in many, uh, in many instances, the nursing documentation is so helpful to understand, oh, well, this, when I was doing medication teaching, for example, the, the patient was able to follow one-step command. So whenever I was demonstrating how to administer his insulin, he was able to just understand one step at a time. Me as a neuropsychologist, that's super helpful for me to know and learn from um, my nursing colleagues, because then that makes me more well-prepared going in that um, room with that patient. So again, looking for those opportunities for um, what, what they can tolerate, not just what they can't tolerate. And then additionally, neuropsych assessment can be helpful for rehab planning, um, disability um, accommodations for return to work, um, because we many of our patients do return to work um, in, in, many, uh, in, many, uh, in many ways. So one of the crucial roles in neuropsych assessment and nursing have a, a very strong overlap also is on the inpatient side, whenever there's a decisional capacity level of care needs, um, that, that's a role that I, pay, uh, I play frequently at San Francisco General, and definitely the, the nursing station is my first stop in those in those evaluations and really what I'm looking for is um, is there waxing and waning um, is the patient sundowning at night is what did night shift say in report in terms of the patient's um, agitation and ability to um, to, to be able to um, take in information what um, what are they interested in? Um, because they're having um, some challenges in, in terms of their care. So uh, I think that, and then what works to be able to manage that. So those are all, um, th those are all very important aspects in, in terms of how I see the nursing practice and the neuropsych assessment dovetail. And then you also might hear something about cognitive rehabilitation. So that really is a systematic applied set of medical and therapeutic services designed to improve cognitive functioning and also uh, help with improving quality of life through you know, people beginning to jump back into certain aspects of their life that are really important to them. Um, but there's not a one size fits all. And so um, speech language pathology, you'll see them involved in cognitive rehabilitation, um, for, especially from a linguistic perspective. On, um, in the neuro-oncology department, in the neurocognitive clinic, neuro, um, all three of us, uh, Dr. Bree, Alexa, and I will all be involved in different ways. Um, but really the goal is, is being able to help patients understand the nature of the challenges they face and their strengths, as well as beginning to develop some um, strategies to work with that, both for the patient as well as the caregiver. So those are, those are really important pieces. And some of the times that we that we're learning is best for uh, cognitive rehabilitation is after they finished active treatment. So neuroplasticity really is the, uh, the basis by which we, we think that cognitive rehabilitation helps to improve cognition through redistribution of cognitive function in intact areas. So again, that's another reason why I'm always looking for those really um, strong functions, because that's where I, I that, those are my go-tos as, as a, a rehabilitation specialist. And so 
we know that um, the as people are healing from radiation and chemotherapy and surgery, the the mechanism of neuroplasticity is blunted, and and so mechanistically, um, those resources are being are being redistributed to healing in the active kind of in the active phase of the the first few months um, after those treatments. But then after that stabilizes out and, and people are a bit more stable, it's a wonderful time for, for rehabilitation. Um, and, and so one of the things that I, I think is um, very, should be very clear, um, if it's not on the slide, but that cognitive rehabilitation is in its very infancy in a brain tumor work. And, and I think that UCSF really is on the cutting edge in their um, in, in their commitment to wanting to understand how this is uh, can be tailored for the patients um, that we see with brain tumors. So I think you'll be hearing a lot more about it. If you work in other neurologic units, such as TBI and stroke, this is old hat to you. You, you definitely had a, a bet, um, had had, had a, a, a better um, you know, interface with cognitive rehabilitation in that, um, in that way. But I would say that you'll be hearing much more about that in the, as we look to the future. So I think this is a question that my nursing colleagues and I are always are grappling with, um, that a patient will be ordered to be given a mini mental or a mocha or, um, and, and then we kind of look at each other like, oh gosh, I don't know if this patient can tolerate this or, oh, I've got so, uh, I don't know what to do with those results after, um, after it's done. How do I integrate that in my nursing practice? So, you know, I think that there's, there's a few things to think about. So there's different sensitivity and specificity for these different, um, these different screening measures. And there is a pretty high uh, false, false negative rate for, um, for example, for the mini mental, because it doesn't really, uh, it, it doesn't really assess executive functioning, processing speed, which are our two major uh, impairments in um, brain tumor. And the MOCA really is something that I think that, um, again, has, uh, through the work of Jeff West, Weffel and Robinson and a few others have definitely noticed that it can ha have a, a high false positive rate. So some of the, and the indications for use with brain tumor, I don't think all is lost. So I don't see it as a, as a all or nothing, but I, I think that there are tools to consider for sure. And, and I do think that they can be quite additive. And if you functionally link them. So if the patient has, for example, a MOCA score of 22, and that's considered, you know, that that's not good. Um, and what I would say is, is that then you can say, well, he had, he, he wasn't able to remember the items that I asked him. And whenever I went back and did, whenever I went back and asked him about the medication education, he also wasn't able to remember that. So if you can, you know, I think that that can be a really nice, um, a really nice combination um, that, that can be quite meaningful and can also then give you a place to start next in terms of, okay, well, whenever, but he did, whenever I gave him reminders, he did remember more. So maybe what he needs is uh, something, you know, he needs more reminders and more teach back and more demonstration. And, um, and, and he needs to demonstrate it back to me whenever we're learning about the, the patient med medication and maybe even involving the caregiver or if there's someone else. So that way the those reminders are there. And then you can move on from there to alarms and medi sets and, and all of the rest. But that's an example of making sure whatever you're finding on these screening tools, thinking about what is a functional symptom the patient is expressing that would be similar. So uh, one-step commands, two-step commands, where is that? Is that showing up on the, on the screening test? Because the, the, it makes sense that they would have problems with, for example, aphasia if they have a left uh, temporal lobe lesion left frontal temporal lesion. It's also time intensive. So I, I think that that's the other thing to consider. Um, and it does not replace a good clinical exam. So again, really focusing on both the, the functional correlates and what the patient's goals of care are and what their health-related quality of life goals are, as well as the some of the cognitive um, screening measures, as well as their, their functionally impairing symptoms. I think of that as like the trifecta, their goals of care, their cognitive symptoms that are showing up on the screening evaluations, as well as um, any kind of uh, functional correlates that you, can, that you can manage. Okay, next. Go down, people, go. Okay, so behavioral management. So 
Um, so one of the things that I think is really important with behavioral management, and I do apologize, I think one of the slides was was just a bit wonky. Um, one of the um, one one of the things that I think about with behavioral management is how exhausting patients, um, you know, our patient practice can be whenever there is a lot of high behavioral dysregulation going on with some of our patients due to a lot of factors. So you know, one of the the major things that I think about is how important it is for us to pace ourselves and, and really pull on our care team um, when, when these sorts of things are happening. So for example, impulsivity, or someone might have a fair amount of challenges with being able to, um, you know, with being able to um, get going in the morning or having a hard time with just being able to, to manage doing um, their own care. Um, and not having insight into that. I think that could be very challenging. And so wanting to make sure that we are guarding ourselves against burnout in the, in the many ways that, that you already know how to take care of yourself, but wanting to keep that in mind, especially with uh, these sorts of challenges. Um, some of the, the most, um, I think some of the, the best cares and partners that I, that I think about in the behavioral management are my nursing assistant colleagues, as well as um, the nurse, my nursing colleagues that can help me track the triggers so we can understand what was going on before this behavior. So before Mr. Jones threw his, um, threw his dinner tray across the, across the room, what was going on in the hours or even the moments leading up to that? Um, lo and behold, I'm thinking about a patient that I saw not that long ago, lo and behold, they were waxing the floors in the hospital and the patient was just, had been out of sorts all day since, um, since they had been doing that, the smells and the noise and, and all of the rest. And, um, and his windows were, you know, his, his uh, curtains were wide open and he, his TV was on and he had a really loud, he was in a, a dual room and he had a really loud partner and he didn't have the coach. That was his favorite coach. He didn't have a favorite coach in the room that day. Um, so all of those were antecedents leading up to, he had just had it. And, and he also had a frontal lobe lesion as well. And so he just was not able to regulate his impulsive and and the, the consequences of what happened of course you know institutional police was called and you know he um it, it ended up being and he ended up getting medication and it can it was a very challenging situation so knowing that we, we began to think about well what are some behaviors we want to reinforce well some of the things that we want to for him to be able to reinforce is, you know, not being able to need those emergent medications and, and wanting him to feel more calm and, and, and also wanting him not to feel so distressed. And so beginning to track some of those um, instances with the nursing staff, as well as not whether, not something really complicated, but just being able to track a few of those, the, the nursing staff and um, were able to begin to anticipate, oh, okay, well, whenever he doesn't have his favorite coach, those are times where, you know, we, we wanna make sure keep in mind that maybe his room placement needs to be in a different place or um or, or maybe that when the um maybe whenever the, the floors are being waxed that, that we can anticipate that we're gonna have more challenges and be able to take uh take off some of the additional interventions like they i think that they begin to kind of um more simplify some of his medications that we're needing to that we're going to get titrated anyway and then also uh, some of his vital signs and neuro checks so again these are ways to begin to think about some behaviors and many behaviors do have you know some precursor triggers and if we can begin to um, manage those it can really be beneficial for patients with more severe and difficult to manage um, behavioral issues, considering psychotropic medications and their psychiatry consultation is really important. I've also seen um, you know, physical, uh, physical use of like bail beds, bedside coaches, and room placement be, um, be beneficial, especially on the, um, on the inpatient side. Next. So some of the behavioral pearls that we talk about, so these are ones that um, I did not come up with. The literature is really uh, generous in that. And also uh, my, my colleagues over time, and, and we've all shared these together. So delay, I want to consider, uh, I want some time to consider what you're saying. So for example, a patient is perseveratively wanting to go buy a Cadillac at the car dealership and the caregiver is just like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to tell him. So um, like, well, we can't go buy the car until we have breakfast. 
and then they have breakfast and then like, well, we can't go by the car till after we get you know ready for the day. Well, we can't go by the car until, um, you know, until we have lunch. Well, we can't go by the car until, um, and so on and so on. And so it kind of gives you a sense of, it's a way to, uh, especially when someone's perseverative and also forgetful, it's a way to begin to just kind of pace out some of that urgency um, in, in a way that's non-confrontive. So distracting. So suggesting another activity, especially whenever um, they, they tend to get stuck on something, but they are distractible. So suggesting another act activity, especially if they don't have an entrenched sense, can, can be can be helpful um, and depersonalize. So realizing the tax are more, more likely part of the disorder, not personal. So think about someone with some executive function problems, but also might have some severe personality traits that are negatively impacting. So they kind of have a bit of a double whammy. Um, again, that taking care of oneself in the context of that and also encouraging um, caregivers to take care of themselves in the context of that is really important. Um, and then detaching, getting some concrete options in a calm but matter of fact manner. I think about this whenever behavior is escalating and when patients are overstimulated. So for example, um, whenever they're feeling they, they can't really take much more information in because their problem solving is narrowed um, and that it's better to be able to give just a couple of options that can absolutely happen, but again, in a matter of a fact way, so you're not adding um, any more affect to the fire. And clustering care, depending on stimulation tolerance, of course, we, that's a, I think that's a tried and true method. Next. So these, these are just some of the resources we talk with patients about. So we highlight fatigue because it is so, so, so part of the brain tumor patient's journey and also our own journey, I think, as care providers. Um, and that um, many of our patients do have, especially with the propensity of their executive functioning problems, they might not have emergent awareness or they might not know in the moment that they're actually exhausted and that um, it comes out in some of these behavioral sequelae, such as, uh, repeated asking questions and, um, and uh, anxiety and irritation and, um, and then also the symptom flares. So some of these patients, some of our patients can absolutely notice that they'll have much more symptom flares and they'll get really worried that maybe there's a recurrence or there's something going on that um, the neuro, neuro the, um, that the neuro-oncologist is missing for some, for, for a particular reason, nothing's really showing up on imaging. Um, and sometimes that, that can be due to um, just over, overexertion, especially in that, remember that curve, whenever the, the, um, it's widening between what they can do and their demands when they go back to work or they're going back to kind of being, um, you know, going back to some of their, uh, their ADL. So that could be a real surprise for patients because they're off treatment, they're off active treatment and they're wanting to re-engage in their life. But unfortunately their body is still recovering and, and the, having that pacing can be really important. So this little graphic is one that we use a lot in terms of thinking about the yerk Dodson curve, that's, that's what this is. And it's a U-shaped curve that there is only so much that we can take before we end up getting burned out. And that if we can kind of begin to think about it like a stoplight, like green is go, yellow is I need to slow down, yield, and red is stop, then um, that can help our patients to both put some words to it. So if you like, um, like one of my colleagues says, if you can name it, you can tame it. Um, if you can put the words to it and begin to think about it, then that can, um, that can really facilitate a good conversation, both with, um, both with the caregiver, as well as the patient, as well as the nursing staff. So like, oh, Mr. Jones, I think you're at a red. Yeah, I think I'm at a red. Okay. I'm going to relax. I'm going to rest after that bath. Cause that was a lot. Um, and there's also for people that are interested to know a bit more about this, um, there also is an, um, in our brain tuber supportive care website, there's a lot of patient education there that's um, easily accessible. So, and it's also um, quite, you know, our patients have felt it to be useful um, in terms of this piece of things. So if you're interested in learning a bit more about um, this particular way to kind of talk about and think about behavioral management of fatigue, I encourage you to go into the, um, the supportive care website and, um, at, and look at the resources tab because it has all that information there. Next. So we're, we're nearing the end of our lecture and, and I, think I'm, uh, I think I'm running close on time, if not right there, I think. Um, so uh, I can't see Margaret as yes or no. So I assume that what, she, what I'm thinking is true. Um, so 
Also, additionally, when patients are fatigued, we, we think about um, these are some of the kind of classic medication or the classic education that we talk about. And this is some of the things that I think that our nursing colleagues that, that you talk about as well. So um, making sure they have a really good medical workup for fatigue. There's lots of reasons like um, Alexa was talking about that patients could have fatigue um, and managing other medical and coping issues. So one of the major things that we see with patients is that they can have lots of other um, psychiatric and also um, medical issues going on. One of the things that I think is a bit more common that's un, uh, a bit less under assessed is PTSD. Whenever some of our patients go through awake surgery, um, we're seeing that some of those patients do report elevated um, post-traumatic symptoms because of remembering that event and, and some of the sequelae associated with it. So we've, um, we've def that is something that, um, that can show up in, in terms of just the, the trauma response and how activating that can be and how exhausting that can be. Um, surprisingly enough, I, I think that we, we found patients to have a really good treatment response with when being referred to treatment, but that uh, you know, is becoming more and more part of what we're looking at. Medication options, sleep, of course, is very important with fatigue. There's a hand in hand relationship with that. And there is some, um, it, it's still in its um, novel phase, but there is some emerging evidence for blue enhanced light therapy, um, 45 minutes a day to, to help with, um, with fatigue. Again, that's still on the investigational side and I'm curious and excited about to see where that goes. Um, and, and whenever I think about with sleep, you know, making sure that you're not getting the, that blue light right before sleep, because we know that that can disrupt um, melatonin production and circadian rhythms. And also as people get older, they can produce less melatonin and become less resistant and become more resistant to uh, being able to take on, um, take, you know, that endogenous, um, the reuptake of that endogenous hormone. So wanting to make sure they have really good solid sleep architecture and sleep behaviors. So winding down activities just prior to bedtime and doing the same thing every time. So that way their body gets used to, oh, it's time to go to bed because these things are happening. Um, limit caffeine in the afternoon, minimize light screens prior to bed. That's hard for me, but I do encourage it. And I do try to do it, especially 30 minutes before bed um, and trying to avoid like stressful conversations and activating, you know, television. And um, I, I now don't check um, my email right before I go to bed like I used to. Um, so I, I think that's been really good. And I also encourage my, my patients to do the same because it does, it can linger with you um, if you find something a bit surprising in there. Um, and then of course, not lying in bed wake too long. So your bed can be associated with not sleeping whenever you lie in bed uh, too long. And so it can be really important to make sure that if uh, a patient can't sleep and, um, and they, and this is more on the outpatient side, cause it's not so possible on the inpatient side, but on the outpatient side, if they're, um, if they're laying in bed and they're, they're laying in bed for hours and hours awake, then that can be a problem for them to actually facilitate sleep. So we encourage people to get up, do something boring, um, you know, a couple of household chores or a warm, a warm shower and then go back to bed um, and try again. Next. So in summary, um, nurses are vital member, members of the cognitive care team for, for brain tumor care. And we really, um, we, we, and I think us working together to uh, sort out some of the cognitive issues, I think that we are really a powerhouse team as, um, as uh, Suzanne would say, but I say we all are a powerhouse team. The ob observation, the ears and eyes that, um, that my nursing colleagues have in the practice of that they're working with patients are so crucial in uh, informing the next care, uh, the next steps with patients and their health related quality of life and addressing some of those challenges. And multiple risk factors we know um, absolutely come into play with that and understanding that and assessing that and find some practical ways to address that in a paced way can't address everything all at one time, but over the course of the longitudinal course, we can try to address some of those factors so patients can feel well and we can feel, we can feel like we've contributed to their wellness. Um, and of course, the interventional focus may change throughout the illness course and being strength focused in terms of what are they doing well, 
what is um, what is in um, what, when they're feeling strong and, and doing well cognitively, what are what is that and how do we understand that neuroanatomically can be a crucial part of that puzzle and involving caregivers whenever possible to optimize success because we know we only know the things that we know about ourselves and sometimes caregivers can can really be a crucial part of the pie to bring it all together in terms of us understanding um, how to help um, how to help the patient and um, their loved ones get to that next level in terms of feeling well. Next. So thank you so much. I'll pause there and um, I'm really excited to talk with folks some more if there's questions that they have, if we have time for those questions. Thanks, Chris and Melissa and Alexa. And I just invite you back for just a moment. Um, I think all of you were here tonight. This was an 18 presentation and um, we're grateful. I know I, I'm leaving here tonight feeling um, like I have a better understanding of um, care that's cognitively informed. And I even think uh, I'm, I'm leaving with a few new strategies to try. Um, so for all of you out there waiting and watching, I just want to give you a rundown. I, I, I did get two or three questions. If we have time, I'll just ask them. And then I want to just turn it back over to Dr. Chang uh, for a wrap up, but I, I don't think we'll be here much longer. Um, so uh, maybe I'll just uh, take turns and, and direct these to you just to ask ask for a brief answer. Um, Dr. Weyer Jamora, I don't work at UCSF and um, I have several patients that I think would benefit from um, some cognitive support. Uh, do you have any recommendations for people like me who don't have um, a formal neuro, neurocognitive clinic like you do? Yeah, yeah. I think that probably we're the exception rather than the rule. And I've more worked in places that didn't have it than did have it. So I can absolutely relate to um, to what you're saying in terms of the care gap um, for, um, for folks. So on the outpatient side, I do think there's some good community partners that we that we work with. Some um, usually it's the neuropsychologists on their um, on their insurance panels, and then really just making sure we're asking the right questions in terms of the reason for the referral. Um, that we want to know what the patient's cognitive status is, but also what to do about it. Um, I think that just asking that question can um, can be really important to um, to getting patients where they go. So I would say that there aren't any particular um, that any particular people that I often you know would refer to in the community. I think it really does depend on the patient's um, payer source and, and wanting to make sure and not make those evaluations a burden for the patients. But there are resources in the community. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Alexa, I have one for you. Um, the caregivers of my patients often think that a patient's behavioral change or their outbursts are intentional um, and directed at them. Uh, do you have any specific tips or strategies or a way to support the caregiver ar around that kind of a concern? Yeah, thank you. That's a really great question because that's something that we hear all the time, especially in my work with caregivers, is that they think that these changes are intentional and um, directed towards them. But I think what, one thing I would hope to impart on all the uh, nurses and allied health professionals today is that the education of knowing that this is really the disease speaking, um, it's the other factors in the life, not really the individual. And much of this is out of their control and, and equipping the caregiver with resources and support um, to manage those changes will be really critical. Okay, thanks Alexa. Now this is our lightning round, one word answer. Um, so uh, this one says, I know, um, and I'm gonna ask each one of you this, okay? I know every patient situation is a little different um, based on the tumor, uh, the extent of the tumor, the location. Is there one tip uh, that might be universally, uh, universally, uh, uh, sorry, universally applied um, that we should all leave here knowing tonight? So I'll start with you, Melissa. Do you have one thing? Mm, I think simplify. Okay. Literally one word, or should I explain that? <laughs> okay, one word simplify. simplify. <laughs> Alexa. Five, two, mood and sleep. Great. And Chris. Overstimulation. Okay, those are all good um, and each different. So thank you so much. Um, we did get one or two questions that came in here right at the end. And 
Uh, for those of you that sent those, I will put those together and we'll send that out. Um, and our hope is, I think I sent this out to all of you. We have recorded this tonight and we will make it um, available uh, to you uh, as soon as we have it produced. Okay. And with that, I'd like to just turn it over to Suzanne, uh, Dr. Suzanne Chang, who will wrap things up for us tonight. So again, I just want to thank everyone for participating in the Adam Clore Neuro-Oncology Nursing Lecture. Please complete the evaluation form. Let us know of topics you would like to be interested in hearing about next year. And as uh, Margareta said, it has been recorded. We'll send it to attendees and it will also be available on the UCSF Brain Tumor Center website so that um, you can refer any of your colleagues to that area when we have it up and running. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to thank the presenters on their comprehensive review of cognitive and behavioral changes in brain tumor patients. But in particular, I'd like to especially thank Margareta Page, who did really an amazing job coordinating this event, and for Ed Woodall's um, assistance in the logistical aspects of the lectureship, sort of getting all your invitations out and all your Zoom information, um, but really a wonderful um, opportunity for us to get together and share how we can improve the lives of our patients um, uh, through this sort of teamwork. So thank you all so much for attending and really appreciate it. Um, so with that, we'll um, say good night and see you again. Hopefully next year, we'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs>